Finish. Mike, Mike. Use more face. <laughs> more face. More beard. Blow more your face, face up. Get up, Mike! Get the donut, Phil! Get the donut! Get the donut! Barbell Shrugged is brought to you by you. To learn more about how you can support the show, go to barbellshrugged.com and sign up for the newsletter. <laughs> Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Chris Moore with CTP behind the camera. We have traveled to uh, San Francisco. We're here at San Francisco CrossFit, joined by Diane Fu. Thank you guys for having me again. Everybody Welcome. loves Diane. There's nothing not to like. She's fantastic. Yep. Yep. You guys are very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make sure, uh, hit, hit up uh, barbellshrug.com. Where's Chris? I'm going to look at the camera. Barbellshrug.com. Sign up for the newsletter, and uh, we'll shoot you messages when we post podcasts and we do other cool things. Uh, and if you haven't noticed yet, we travel quite a bit, and we might be coming close to you. So if you sign up for that, you will be notified. Check it out. The first to know. You'll... Well, you might be. Well, you might know before me. Uh, that, <laughs> there's a lot of times I don't even know what we're doing. Uh, all all like, too often. Where am I? Yeah. What day is I it? I woke up. So check this out. I'll tell a quick story. Even though we're interviewing you and hanging out. No, I want to hear about, more about you guys. We're gonna talk about me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were at uh, Mark Devine's place at Seal Fit down in Encinitas, California, on Tuesday, and so we did like we filmed a lot, and we did a. He goes. He texted me a few days beforehand. He goes, we're going to do op wad, you know, operator wad uh -huh. at 7 a.m. I was like, oh, all right, this is going to be fun. Uh, Sounds terrible. Yeah. So uh, we, it turns it's a three hour ordeal. Oh it's like four God. workouts in one with uh, warrior yoga to top it off at the end. What is warrior yoga? You need to go down to Encinitas <laughs> and find out. <laughs> do I? Do I really? Well, ordeal wad. Yeah, you know, uh, next time I'm in Encinitas. Come down. All right. And we'll hang out and we'll do an op wad let's, followed by warrior yoga. Let's do this. I am a little scared. <laughs> let's make this happen. Uh, yeah. So I took a nap afterwards. We ate pancakes and bacon and eggs. And then I went and took a nap and I woke up and I didn't know where I was. I woke up and I was just like, I didn't even know what year it was. Like The pancakes and the bacon were post wad. <laughs> yeah. It's just a combination of a three hour workout with that many carbohydrates put me into like a coma. And uh, I was in such a deep sleep and woke up and I just, I didn't even know my name. I mean, it was, it, for like 15 minutes, Doug saw me. I was sitting in the kitchen just like staring at the wall. Man, I want that kind of sleep. I don't know when the last time I had that kind of sleep. That sounds nice. <laughs> Well, we Go can make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you ate like 15 pancakes? How much time do you guys have after this? <laughs> Let's do this. I'm not doing no one of those op wads. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat the pancakes, though. I'm down for that. Man, Absolutely. that sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. We were just talking about the music in here. How it was awesome. I, I was, we were setting up, and I was like, man, this music is sweet. We play some fun music. Right my, need, uh, can we follow your playlist here? Yeah, absolutely. My current favorite, uh, we do Pandora off Sonos here. Pandora off Sonos. Uh, my favorite station is the Chromio station. I Chromio? Yeah, Chromio. Chromio. You guys have to look them up. They so are, Pandora yes. and then Chromio, Chromio station. Chromio, right now. Love it. Damn. They, they are my favorite band right now. I, you know, unfortunately only discovered them, you know, maybe within the last few months. And I, since then, I, I follow them on Instagram. Like, they are just, you know, two guys, super fun. You know, a lot of fun music, kind of funky, a little bit retro. They've got good yeah. beats, you know, good mixes. They are super fun to listen to, especially in a gym, because you could keep it casual. Because inside a gym, you have to almost, you can't be so upbeat all day long. By the time you're done coaching, you're just like, Wah. so it's almost yeah. like DJing. You got to kind of have it go up and go down. And Chromio is one of those bands where you can kind of, or the station, you can play in the background. It's kind of yeah. fun, but it won't zap you in it's about two or three spot. hours. It's just, it is the sweet spot. Like in old school cool. Python days, it was just 
at some point you're like, I don't want to hear any more hate breed ever. Yes. No more screaming. <laughs> There's nothing to be mad about. We're going to have a good time. Let's turn on some chrome. You know, the, was it chromeo? Chromeo. Chromeo. Hit the sweet spot right in the middle. Ride a nice little wave. Yes. Not too high, not too low. Yes. Well, you were exactly. asking me, like, what are your members like? Yes, what are your members well, we like? Put a, we put like a list up one day. We said, hey, uh, you know, we're going to create a playlist. Put down the music you wanted. And when pe- what people wrote down was like jokes. We are the champions. Yeah, nobody took like, that seriously. It was like, we are the champions. I'm like, you know what? Guess what? I the guess Rocky we're not creating a playlist. Anymore. You get what you deserve. That's man. right. The Rocky Three playlist. Do you let your members have access to the radio? Can they go over there and change it? Or is that like like hands off staff only? No, we the coaches basically have access to the Sonos, but people take requests. Like we try to we try to cater to our members, but again, our music's pretty good, so you know, they kinda go. Oh, grooving. So uh when was the last time we were here? In November? So it's been about six months Sounds since right. we talked last. Six months? Yeah, and uh if you didn't watch or listen to that podcast we did, did with Diane. Shame on before, you, first of all. Shame on you. Go me. listen to that. Come back and listen to this because then we're just going to be catching up today. So what have you been doing the last six months? What's, uh, what's new? I know you've been crushing seminars, teaching people weightlifting, learning more about weightlifting because you're one of those people that are always learning, unlike some weightlifting coaches who have their way. You know who and you if, are. And if, and if you don't do it this way, you're wrong. Right. But that's why I'm a big fan of Diane Foods. Thank you. Um, last six months, so lots has go- been going on. I've been uh, seminaring like a crazy woman, going around, but it's been great. You know, you get to obviously, you guys know, you get to go around, meet different communicate communities, have many interesting conversations. Um, since then, I've also been in collaborations with some um, weightlifting coaches and athletes. Uh, Kendrick Ferris and I have a camp coming up just uh, next weekend, oh, nice. uh, where we'll be kind of bringing our philosophies together, and we'll be doing a three-day kind of training workshop for athletes coming down into Kalipa's NorCal. Um, I've since then also uh, opened a Kickstarter campaign, which we can talk about since everyone can learn from. Uh, that's unfortunately not going to fund, but we are still going to be doing something along the lines of that project. Oh, thank God. And <laughs> I, I really, no, I mean, I was, I mean, I am still super excited about that. Yes. So are we. Yeah. Um, it's going to work. Yes. And uh, we, I am also having many, many interesting conversations. Was it last November that I talked to you guys? I think so, yeah. Last November. Mm-hmm. So within that mm-hmm. time frame, I've got a, had a chance to hang out with, you know, the Russian coaches and athletes that have been coming into town and doing seminars oh, yeah. basically oh, yeah. all you over ran the world. With, uh, Mr. Klokov, right? Mr. Klokov. So I got a chance to hang out with him uh, down in Oahu in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. You drink and, vodka uh, with those guys. That's all I want to do. Your I don't want to talk training. <laughs> I don't life talk is almost as hard. Yes. I want to drink I want to drink vodka with those dudes. Um, yeah. It was actually a really kind of special time that I went down with them because it was in November. Uh, my friends down at CrossFit Oahu invited me out to be able to attend the seminar and hang out with them for the weekend. And the weekend they were seminaring happened to fall over Thanksgiving. So I'm like, well, why don't I come out early? And they're like, yeah, please come have Thanksgiving dinner with us. We're having it catered. You know, Klokov, Polovnikov, they're all going to be there. And so I'm like, um, yes, I'm coming out right away. So Twist my arm. Yeah, right twist my arm a little bit harder, please. So, you know, booked my flight, went out there, showed up on Thanksgiving night went up and I'm walking up the stairs and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to meet Dimitri Klokov. And as soon as I walk up the stairs, Dimitri pops up and he's like, Oh my God, Diane Fu. And it was Hello. just like this weird. My uh, name is oh, wow. How are you? <laughs> yeah, it was like this. He was like excited to see you. Yeah, it, we were like just really excited to see each other because oh, we had wow. been following each other on social media. He'd been, um, you know, kind of liking my photos and. Um, he's fantastic. He's a genuinely nice guy. He yeah. is like great. He's funny. He's a little quirky, obviously. Um, strong as shit. Did, did you let him? Strongest man in the world. Did you let him snatch you? Um, no, I should you? have. I should have. I, I think <laughs> I was just like a little too nervous around him. But <laughs> it was great. So, we, you know, we saw each other and it was like, oh, and then immediately we had to Instagram it, right? So <laughs> we took some photos and, uh, you know, I, I got to have Thanksgiving dinner with Dmitry Klokov and Vasily Panofikov. And uh, what was cool is I managed to capture uh, Klokov's entire Thanksgiving kind of toast yeah. on camera and I posted it on my Facebook page. So that, oh, I mean, wow. that's, I that. that's I just a cool that. experience, right? Was it in mm-hmm. English? Um, it was translated. He had his translator. So Yasha Khan was there with I him. I looked that up. So he did translate the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So it was really cool. If you go back to basically Thanksgiving of 2013, it's sitting right on Fubar Bell Facebook page. Wow. Oh, on your fan page. On my fan page. What oh. I love I tried about, to be your friend on Facebook. Did I accept you? It, it wouldn't let me. It wouldn't even let oh. me ask. 
<laughs> you can ask now. I'll accept you. I was going to say too many like, friends. No, no, you wouldn't. Even, Facebook wouldn't let me. Oh, Facebook wouldn't let you. Yeah. Did you have too many friends? No, he doesn't. Or have do I? Have, are, no, are you, you capped you out? You have more friends than me. <laughs> can he speak enough English to have like a regular conversation, even if he can't give like a well thought out speech? You know, um, his English. His spoken English, I believe, I have to believe it's getting better. Uh Like he can say, he obviously sees and then he can give like, you know, singular word like corrections Mm. like, oh, you like, you know, yes, you know, I like, and then he'll put you in the right place. So He can touch and move you too to be in a mechanical position. So the information definitely got across, which also tells a lot of us you don't actually need a lot of words to be a pretty decent coach, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And then Yasha was there obviously to translate. And so... You know, he can definitely get by and he understands more than he can speak. Mm. Right. He's been around the information, I think, enough. I really love how those guys and what you've done and some of the other names of Wayland have all jumped sort of feet first, full speed into the Instagram culture, coaching, sharing tips, just filming lifts and sharing what they're doing and right. engaging people. I love Klokov's little tagline, like we win together for his company. Like I think it's fantastic. Winner. Ter- yeah, winner. Winner clothing company tearing down the walls and sort of just mixing ideas and getting together and like quit being in silos and like you said I think the coolest thing about what you're doing in these seminars and mixing it up with Kendrick and these other athletes is like this sport will move forward if we get rid of our bullshit and mix ideas and right. make something better out of it and just continue to share you know you're not always going to nail it 100% and uh, but the idea is just continuing to put your best foot forward mm-hmm. and then not believing that if you share something that has worked for you and you engage and mix that something great won't come of it it's not, you're not losing anything by sharing your ideas no. not, it's only not making the whole community better including you and, and here's the thing is people want to hear what you have to say. Sometimes I'll put something out and I'll be like, oh, maybe this is just too basic of an idea. And then that idea just blows up and I just sit there yeah. and I'm just like, whoa, okay. Like I didn't expect it to have this kind of response, you but it did. assume that these people know it. It hurts right. your ability to coach them. You know? And then other times I'll put an idea out and I'll be like, I'm about to change weightlifting history. And I put it out. <laughs> <laughs> and nah, nobody yeah. even and notices. Then nobody really notices. So you, you just, got like you just don't like, know. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. This is how you, you're learning the internet. Diane, you're learning the internet and how it works. You know, things that I think is epic, other people don't. And things that I think are really basic that everyone should know, they don't. And they love it. So you just have to keep putting it out there. I think that's a really common thing for experts to do. They put out a beginner idea and the market for beginners is so much bigger that they get a huge response and they put something out that like they just learned. Yeah. And there's only like four other people in the world that like really get why that's so cool. They give you the courtesy applause. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's funny. If you just put a picture, like Photoshop a picture of a kitten snatching, you get like fucking 10,000 likes on Instagram though. That's the lowest level of the internet. Yeah. That's what that's what works every time. You guys want to know what my PR is currently on my Instagram? Oh, my PR. It? Like how, how many likes? likes per what kind I don't of know. How many likes? I don't know if I want to know. How many likes? No, it's actually not that impressive. No, 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 it's three, not that impressive. You're getting like 2K, 3K? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's it's like maybe 25. I mean, it could be higher now, 26, 2700. But, you know, if I put put a really good post out and it's informational, I'll get around mm. like 1300. I mean, in, you know, in the Instagram world, the large scale, not that, you know, nothing whatever. Nothing to scoff at. Right, nothing to scoff at, not that great, right? whatever but what PR'd for me on my Instagram was just this past Monday Memorial Monday I posted a photo of my bulldog sitting in the sun enjoying the sunshine and we happened to have this little American uh, flag kind of um, uh, placard homemade placard kind of sitting on his side so Mm. it kind of looked like he was just at peace and like almost being enjoying Zen, himself Zen dog Zen dog and I posted it up and it was just this perfect photo the lighting was great and all of a sudden it just started blowing up like people could not get enough of it and I'm just like oh my god oh and look who's here hey oh, oh, the man. Kelly Star X <laughs> the Kelly Star X um, so I mean look basically I my scared. dog Hugo PR'd for me I mean that, it's amazing well, it drills into this basic you know, emotion and elements. People just love to see something that just warms their heart. Yes. So combine the more yes. dog with your way up in coaching. And you might you might wind up somewhere, kid. Yes. <laughs> more more Hugo in every single photo. What yeah. if you could get Hugo to snatch? That would be amazing. dog to weight lift. That's I would have to happen. retire from Foo Barbell and uh, basically take my dog on the road. Um, <laughs> it was nice knowing you guys. I do hope we keep in touch. You fellas are great. <laughs> I enjoyed the ride while it lasted. Are you trying so, uh, I was going to say, so as a person who's gone around and learned weightlifting from from many different coaches, what was the big takeaway from meeting Klokov and, and the rest of his guys? 
Um, so the big thing with the Russian poll is, you know, they they teach. So in America, let's start here. Our baseline is we teach something called the S curve or the S pull, right? Mm-hmm. The bar is supposed to sweep in, it comes in, probably loop out a little bit, and it's supposed to create like a nice, beautiful S. So you know, and and the idea is, you know, get that S as tight as possible for increased efficiency, right? Mm-hmm. Bottom line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the Russians come in and they're like, well, no, not the S-Pole. S-Pole is very 70s. It's old. It's a little bit dated. Um, now they want something what they call a very straight pole. So the bar basically from the floor comes up straight and they want to continue that bar path as linear as possible. So all of their movement um, is basically created around how to create this very tight pole. The other thing that's really interested, interesting about the Russians is they're like, look, you know what? We want you to hang out on top of your pole a little bit longer. Meaning, whereas a lot of, you know, in the States, a lot of our coaches, when we hit that top level of extension, there's this idea of the shrug, right? You know, to teach the shrug or not to teach the shrug. That's another right. debate. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, our coaches will be like, okay, you know, once you hit extension, the shrug pulls you under, right? And what the Russians actually want you to do is at the top of the shrug or at the top of the extension, they want you to actively punch your ankles through the floor and then shrug to continue elevating the bar higher, which, you know, in the States, if we saw somebody do that, we'd be like, oh man, you're over pulling. You know, you're staying on top of your pull too long. You're going to end up a little bit short. Mm. But in their thinking is they're like, guys, we're big men. We're big women. We are tall. We are big. We got more length to cover. If Mm. we don't lift that bar a little bit higher, we are not getting underneath that weight. So that's kind of their whole thinking behind that punch and shrug. Uh, Another thing that was really interesting is, um, Again, in the States, we're, we're kind of split because there, there are so many different coaching philosophies and styles. Um, in the States here, some coaches are really big on, hey, to, to bang or to not to bang the bar, right? To bang or to yeah. brush the bar. That's another debate. And so the Russians are definitely, you know, of the banging camp. And a uh, little story that's really interesting is Annie Thor's daughter came through our box maybe a couple months ago. Um, I believe she was, it was before she came out for 14.5. So mm-hmm. she had come through again you know maybe a month or two with uh before that with her boyfriend frederick and i know you know through social media that she had hung out with klokov during his time or during his yeah, tour in some europe was together and had yeah a good yeah time. it was great and so i know how annie moves like annie works with carl i've worked with her in the past um you know, she moves okay y- yami yeah works her. <laughs> so we've all seen how she moves and yeah. so her bar path prior to kind of you know, coming together with Klokov is she's very graceful. She's very fluid. She's very smooth. Like everything's just like, you know, butter. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I know how she moves. So I was really curious myself what her takeaway was from Klokov seminar. So I was like, Hey, you hung out with Klokov, you know, recently when he did his tour through Europe, she's like, Oh yeah. And I was just like, Hey, what did you think of it? And she's like, Oh, I really liked it. And I asked her and Frederick, I'm like, is there something from that seminar you would take away and adopt into your own technique, right? And she's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, what is it? And I'm super curious, right? And she's like, oh, he told me really to bang the bar, get after the bar. I'm <laughs> like, oh, really? Because that is not how she moved before. right? And I'm like, oh, really? That's, you know, I'm like, why is that? Why did you like it? Right. And she's like, oh, because it gave me a 10 pound PR. I'm like, sure. I'd like <laughs> that. a good enough reason, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it gave me a 10 pound PR on my snatch. I'm like, and when yeah, you're new to, when you're new to weightlifting or CrossFit, you're getting a 10 pound PR. It could be a million different things. Sure. But if you've been competing for a long time, 10 pounds is yeah, a big when deal. you're an athlete. Yeah. At it was something level, real. It is real. Mm-hmm. It is, it is a real technical improvement that allowed her to be able to express that weight. Absolutely. So how do they, how are they telling people to, to accomplish the banging of the bar, As, you know, because I mean, people, pe- you know, all coaches are teaching, keep the bar close, extend the hips, hips, keep the bar, um, actively pulled into you. And right. so everyone's teaching to touch the bar right. at the hips at least. And so it, it, are there any cues that they're giving that are different? Did it make that consistent? Well, yes. So here's the deal. Is, most, you know, li- most CrossFitters aren't even touching the bar to their hips. Yeah, you know, some actually, are wearing, <laughs> some are wearing yeah. underwear with pads on the front too. You, you know, it's funny as I go around to my seminars and uh, we'll, you know we'll talk about we'll touch very lightly upon like, hey, should you bang? Should you brush? And you know, for me, it's not really a debate on whether you bang or brush. It's you know, I, I say, hey, really, let's let's just face it. It's what happens after the bar leaves your hips, right? Yeah. If the bar keeps going upward versus just looping big around and you know around your body where you have to do something crazy to pull it back in, mm-hmm. then bang or brush, whatever technique works for you. Let's hey, let's have fun with. It, right. right. So, um, 
Or I just digress. What were you, what was the question? Oh, well, how, how, how do they teach? The how do they teach? That? Okay, yeah. so in the states, you know, a lot of times we're, we talk about when we sweep back, we really want athletes to sweep really hard back into the heels, right? So that that's what accomplishes that shifting of the weight, mm-hmm. sweeping the bar back kind of into the the deep deep base of the foot. And with the Russians, they're like, no, 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 no don't don't sweep it into your heels, right? <laughs> just just here's your foot, and just keep it right in the middle. Keep it right in the middle of your arch. Keep the weight right in the middle of your foot mm-hmm. and just stand up and just stand up. Keep your chest up. Keep it stand up. I like and it. If you stand Seems up, simpler. it's actually really, <laughs> it's actually quite amazing. It is actually really simple. If you, if you think about it, it took me a minute to kind of, kind of really be able to digest that. And I'm like, yeah, I can't be that easy. But really, if you sit there and you line up and we can do it with you guys and try it out. If you line the bar right in the middle of your foot, you get yourself set up, you go to the bar and you just stand up. As soon as you're at extension, that bar is at your hips. It's just that easy. And then from there, you finish, pop your hips, and then ankles and shoulders send the energy continually separate. Is there a general, would you say, like um, effort to not overanalyze and overthink on their part? Like, look, be strong, move well, and just train hard. Yes, and I'm paraphrasing Klokov when I say this. Um, the percentages could be a little bit off, but when he said it, it was like, he's like, hey, weightlifting is 90% strength, 10% technique. Now, you know, coming from his level, it probably means something a little different because his well, technique when is super at, When you're lifting at eight great. years old, too, your idea yeah. of technique work is different. Yeah, yeah. have you yeah. seen his, uh, his, his old school videos of him as a kid? Um, I have On seen some, yes. They are fantastic. He's you know skinny little, like, what, he's 11 or 12. You forget, like, those guys have been training at a high level, Often, frequently, you know, his dad is his dad was a national level athlete as well, yes, right? Weight yes. lifter. And he was he was been he was, it was it was second nature to him from the time he was a, a young child to right. do the lifts and do them a certain way. So yeah, his, his strength ability really complements that yeah. really well. well. Yes. At, his, at his level too, everyone it's just assumed that everyone knows how to do the technique. Right. Maybe they argue over these little details and they have a little, a little bit of a different style, a little bit of a different spin on how it's done. But there's world champions in every different style, so. The details on the technique aren't as important. You just need to be super, super strong and pick a technique right. that works for you and stick with it. Well, you know, Klokov and Polovnikov will openly say, too, like when they were coming, they had to come together and create the seminar together. And then I will also add then, you know, when they came from the States back to the mainland, um, then Ilya also joined them as well. Mm-hmm. So Ilya Ilyan kind of came through and started touring around the United States with them. And so when you get these three kind of mega rock stars of weightlifting together, um, they're going to come in with varying philosophies. So yeah, they're all know, quite different. They, they train differently. They I train differently. And do. You know, they move a little differently. But the idea is that this difference evolved from them based on their, you know kind of physical anatomy and their individualities. It's not something that they were taught. So the idea is that they came through, they basically talked and, you know, debated, discussed all these different components to then, you know, how should we teach this progression inside our seminars? How should we teach this to the people? And uh, they all came together and agreed like, hey, look, we may look and move a little differently at this high, high level, but that's because we are at a very high level. When we're talking about creating that foundation, when we're talking about creating that base, it looks the same. Everybody looks the same. And then at some point, because you need to veer to continue improving your numbers, mm-hmm. that's when they started to veer off and that's when they started to look different. Mm-hmm. Very well put. I haven't, I haven't actually heard anyone say it in that way, but I feel like that's exactly how it happens, and no one's been able to articulate it just like you just did. Right. Well, you know, here's the problem of looking at lifters. When we, when we look at movement only at that international level, um, they all look really good, but we're also only looking at these people performing like they're potentially lifetime best or near their you know high, high levels. I'm actually really interested in movement that, you know, that happens kind of at all levels because I feel like largely that's as a coach, I get to, I learn more from watching people that are super beginner Mm -hmm. all the way to beginner intermediate to intermediate, intermediate advanced and then advance into, into the elite, right? Watching lifters at the elite, elite level is fun and it's very attractive, but as a coach, I'm interested in everything underneath that scale. That's where the magic I just think the most, the most fun thing to watch is the elite guys not doing one RMs though. It's watching them pull weights that you can pull and how fast they are with the weights oh, that you yeah. can pull. Ridiculous. And you go, oh, yeah. shit. Okay, yeah, I get it. I remember yeah. being at the, uh, I think I'd been weightlifting for like a year, and uh, we went to the Arnold Classic. It was like 2007, mm-hmm. and the Chinese showed up, 
and uh, they didn't lift at the meet. They just lifted on the stage as a, you know, in the expo hall just to show what they could do. And they were like power, you know, 77 kilo guy was like power snatching 110, 120. I was like, oh, I have a hard time cleaning, jerking that. Like, <laughs> so much work. And it was, you just got really sad. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking back on it, I, I get sad. So yeah. Yeah. Seeing guys like just smoke weight at, you know, the high level guys, that is, everyone needs to go to like a, na you know, national level weightlifting meet or international if you can and watch just the speed. Cause I, I had my coach always tell me like, you got to go faster. I was like, I'm going as fast as I can. And then just seeing someone move at that speed was like, oh, there's everything in like the gym. That. There's things in the gym that happen that aren't wrapped up on the whiteboard and not said in words that make a huge amount of difference. So like you got to be in the presence of somebody you want to aspire to be like in order to get a lot of the information that is lost in a training blog or a coaching video. Oh, yeah, to be absolutely. in the presence of a good lifter is what it takes to be a really good lifter. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a good power throw, way other side. You, you go to where they are. <laughs> yes, yes I, I completely agree. Um, you know, when I go to a lot of the national meets or even at the local level, you know, because we have, especially in the Bay Area, a lot of really good lifters. Um, my favorite place to hang out is the training hall, is the platform, is the oh, yeah. stage. I like seeing how people warm up. I like seeing their routine. I like watching their focus. And granted, if it's going to be some like, hey, you know, new Pan Am record or whatever record that they're about to break, then sure, I'll kind of duck around the curtain to watch them lift on the platform. But really, my fun is had in the training hall behind, like just behind the scenes, just watching how people do their thing. Yeah. You're going to go to Salt Lake in July? Um, nationals? N I'm not going to make it to nationals this year. I'm kind of hanging around town. I've got oh. some family business that I have oh. to take care of. So that's going to keep me grounded this year. Bummer. Yeah. But we have our, our lifter, Kristen Newman. Uh, one of my athletes will be out there uh, this, you know, this summer representing. Okay. Yes. You're going to go to the Olympics in, in 2016 down in Brazil? I We're thinking would, about going. Yes. I'm actually Should we party? Thinking, have a little. Uh, yeah. Yes. I am highly Mojitos, considering. Good times. That would be a good time. And we should uh. podcast again. We'll podcast before that, but we'll do it again. Absolutely. If we're still we'll podcasting in Brazil. <laughs> if we're still podcasting in That's a long time from now. That is a long Jeez. time. Two years. Yes. Uh, we could I be think, doing I something totally so. different. Well, I'm trying to freak people out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, man, maybe it won't be around forever. <laughs> Don't take this part for granted. Scarcity. Scarcity. <laughs> That's right. Watch it while you can. It could be over Don't any worry. day now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's take a break real quick. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, some of the projects you're working on and okay. specifically your book. Let's do it. Yep. All right, this is part two of the Jerk Series. Video one was all about the overview. Uh, video two is about the dip and drive phase of the lift. That's this video. And then vi video number three, excuse me, is going to be on the catch and the recovery, both for split jerks and for power or squat jerks. All right, my name is Doug Larson with the Barbell Shrug Podcast. This is Alex Macklin. He's one of our faction and Barbell Shrug weightlifting coaches. Uh, first, Alex is going to demo a full split jerk, and then we're going to break down the dip and drive portion. All right, we're going to run through things one by one. First, if you look at Alex from the side, he's standing nice and tall, and the barbell is resting all the way on his shoulders. There's no space under the bar. A really common problem is that people catch, new people rather, catch the bar and there's space here. They're holding the bar in their hands and they're not letting it rest comfortably on their shoulders. So go ahead and do it wrong for a second. Grab the bar. See all this space is right here? That's going to kill your power. If you're relying on how strong you are holding a bar in your hands versus letting it rest all the way on the shelf of your shoulders, you're going to jerk 20% of what you're going to be able to jerk otherwise. Uh, and it's not going to look very pretty. Okay, so um, elbows always high. Ideally, your hands would be closed. Alex keeps his, uh, his hands a little bit open when he jerks. Uh, ideally, you'd have them all the way closed. It's not necessarily necessary, but uh, ideally, that would be the case. So if Alex can maybe close his hands just for a second. There you go. So this way, with your hands already closed, you don't throw the bar up and then have to catch it at the top. Your hands are already around the bar. No catching necessary. And that's, uh, in my opinion, the most stable, secure, safe way to do it, okay? All right, again, from the side, if we look at Alex, as he dips, go ahead and dip and pause at the bottom, he keeps his elbows high, and he keeps a vertical torso. It's not like a squat where you bend forward as you go down. In a squat, you keep a vertical shin, you push your butt back, in some variations of squat anyway. For a jerk, that's not how it is at all. 
you go vertical torso, knees go forward, weight stays on the heels. What a lot of people do, again, if Alex does it wrong, do it like a regular squat where your elbows go down and your butt goes back. That's a bad, that's a bad jerk, okay? You just want to dip very shallow with a vertical back, go and do it correctly one more time, just like that. Any further than that, you're probably dipping too far, okay? All right, so I'm gonna use this PVC pipe as kind of a vertical reference line so you can see the difference when Alex does it correctly with a vertical back when he dips and when he does it incorrectly when he does it more squat style with his butt going back and his torso tilting forward incorrectly. So you can do it correctly here, vertical back, go ahead and go. Okay, the bar basically goes straight down, might even go back a little bit, and then go ahead and do it wrong once where you tilt forward. Okay, see how much space that is? You don't wanna have that space there. If the bar goes forward and then I go to launch it, I have to pull it back because remember, I'm going to catch it behind my head. I would have to pull the weight back even further. More than likely, I'm going to launch it forward <laughs> and it's going to be out in front of you and you're going to miss the lift. So you want to dip with that vertical back because then you're not going to have to chase the weight at all. You're going to be able to throw it behind you and catch it overhead um, easier. All right, another quick tip on elbows. Your elbows are up, as I said earlier, and then as you dip, I like to push my elbows up as I dip. So if you look at Alex's elbows, as he goes down, he's going to try and lift his elbows up like a half inch. There you go. Again, that's going to keep, that's the cue I like to use for me to keep that vertical torso. So I like to go up and then up again as I drive out of that dip and that reminds me to keep my elbows high and that reminds me to keep that vertical torso and kind of everything falls in place for me when I use that cue. Again, what you don't want to do, a lot of people will dip and then They'll go like this, and then when they go to drive, their elbows go down like that. I see that a lot. Uh, I feel like I see it more in women than I do in men, but it's probably a problem with everybody, and I'm just way sexist and biased. I'm not sure. All right, uh, for the elbows also. You see Alex's elbows go out a little bit from his shoulder. He's not in like this. He wants his elbows to be out wide like that. That's going to help him kind of spread his chest and externally rotate where he's not caving in like this. See, a lot of times people don't have very good shoulder mobility. They go like this and then they cave like that because they don't have enough shoulder mobility or upper back extension to hold the bar very well. So you want extended, extended, elbows out, shoulder blades, not together, but somewhat, somewhat retracted where you're not rolled forward with bad posture out of position. All right, uh, we're gonna talk about the timing of the dip and basically staying stable in your midsection by uh, controlling your breathing. So what Alex wants to do, he's gonna take a, he's gonna pop the bar, take a big deep breath, and then he's gonna squeeze his glutes and kind of pull his rib cage down a little bit, and he's creating a lot of uh, intra-abdominal pressure. That way when he goes to dip, he's as solid as possible all the way through his torso. You don't wanna be sloppy there. You don't wanna breathe out all the way and just kind of be loose. Uh, you're not gonna be able to throw up as much weight as you would if you're nice and stable. So. Again, if this is heavy, you're not going to be able to just take a big breath in. You might have to give it a little bit of a pop, take that breath, and then you're going to want to do your jerk once the bar starts, stops oscillating, because that's illegal to get a bounce and then do your jerk. Once the bar stops oscillating, you're going to want to go right into it, because if you're holding your breath with a bunch of weight, or a little bit of weight, uh, you're going to get tired, <laughs> and uh, you're, or you're going to black out is what's going to happen too. So uh, You want to take that breath, get stable, and then go right away. Uh, as far as, uh, what's the other thing we were talking about? Just a second ago. Uh, dipping, timing. Oh, timing, that's right. Okay, uh, as far as timing goes, uh, again, you want that shallow dip. It's controlled on the way down, and you're trying to get the bar to oscillate. Uh, a lot of nicer Olympic bars are going to be somewhat kind of whippy and flexible. You want the bar to oscillate and kind of spring up as you spring down under it. So that's hard to see with no weight on the bar because there's nothing to kind of make the bar bend. Uh, but if you look at Alex, he's going to have a controlled dip and then he's going to fire out of the hole very quickly to get a nice bounce on the weight. There you go. Go and do it more full speed. There you go. Okay, so you can see what Alex is not doing is he's not dropping so fast that the weight kind of disconnects and then when he goes to go up, the weight crashes on top of him. Okay? Uh, that's, a, that's a funny timing thing if you've ever felt it. If you drop too quick, you'll, you'll disconnect from the weight, and then as you go to jump, it will slam on top of you, and your timing will be all screwed up. So I don't know if you can simulate that. Go ahead and try it. You might hear yourself in the chin with, with very lightweight. 
Yeah, so see that little bit of a disconnect? Perfect. Right underneath the bar, you can see there's a little air gap between the shoulders and the bar when he drops too quick. Again, that's probably exaggerated. It won't be that big with, uh, with full one rep max type weight, uh, but uh, the whole point of this is that you want to dip smooth and then drive out fast so you can get that nice oscillation off the bar. All right, as far as stance goes, how wide your feet are going to be, if you look at Alex right now, he's basically somewhere in between hip width and shoulder width apart. Uh, there's no need to be basically anywhere except for vertical legs. You don't want to be excessively wide. You don't need to toe out at all, basically. You can just be nice and normal, feet more or less straight ahead, uh, legs totally vertical. So if Alex racks the weight, you can see his feet are basically straight under him. As he dips now, as he dips, his knees are going to come forward or maybe slightly to the outside. Just like that, his knees never dive in this way. They never dive in like that. They're always out, just like that. It's gonna save his knees over time and hopefully he'll be stronger there as well. And then also on the dip, if we come around to the side, as Alex dips, we already talked about having that vertical torso and the knees coming forward. The important thing there is that as your knees come forward with that vertical torso, you're still staying super heel heavy and you're not coming onto your toes whether your knees are diving in or not, you should be not on your toes, you should be on your heels. So if you look at Alex, he's going to dip at the vertical back. The center of pressure of his foot is right down, straight down, maybe back on his heels, maybe midfoot, but it's definitely not toe heavy at all. If he does it incorrectly, you'll see his, the back of his heels slightly come off the ground. So that's something I look for a lot when I'm coaching weightlifting is I'm always watching the back of someone's heels nice and slow. Yeah, you can see that wiggle right there. That little bit of a wiggle lets you know that the, the center of pressure on his foot moved forward. And that means since the weight wants to be over your center of pressure, the weight's going to float forward as well. And then again, you're more likely to miss the lift out in front of you. So you're always looking at the back of someone's heels to see if, even if it's very subtle, to see if it goes like that. You get that little bit of a movement as opposed to this. It should look like that. It never should look like this. Like, like an there should be Oompa no Loompa. wiggle on the back of the foot. Like an Oompa Loompa. Oompa Loompa's got wiggly feet? No, there you go. <laughs> that's the dance, the Oompa Loompa dance. Oompa. <laughs> Let's get the Oompa Loompa dance on here. <laughs> All right, one more way to look at that vertical back is to put somebody up against the wall or one of the uprights. And as he dips, you can see his back stays right up against the upright, knees forward heel heavy, if his shoulders come way forward, then you can, his butt can't come back right now because it's, it's buttoned up against this, but uh, if he does it wrong, he'll, he'll feel his butt hit the wall or he'll feel his shoulders disconnect from the wall. And so not only can you see it, but he'll be able to feel when he does it wrong as well. So that's, that's a great drill for new people to learn how to jerk, is to put them all up against the wall. You know, even if you have a dozen people, you can put them up against the wall, have them all dip with a vertical back and try to keep their back connected to the wall the entire time. Oompa, loompa, doopity doo. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that more or less covers it for the dip, the downward portion of the lift, the drive where you're coming back up and accelerating the bar, all those same principles still apply. You're still coming up with your elbows high, you still have that vertical torso, you're still driving through your heels, everything is more or less the same. Where people fall short on the dip and drive, is that oftentimes they won't extend their hips all the way, they'll cut their, their drive off early, especially when it gets heavy and they'll just try and sneak under the weight without really getting the weight as high as possible. Now, so go ahead and do it correctly one time. There you go, beautiful. Now go ahead and cut your, your drive off a little bit early where you're not getting the full hip extension. Try and sneak under the weight. There you go, ah, that was beautiful. Beautifully wrong. <laughs> All right, so if you could see that, the first time Alex did a, a full drive, the bar you know, threw, flew rather way up here. The second time, it only went to about here before he snuck himself under the weight. So you want to get that full drive every time, never cutting it off early. All right, so that was video two on the dip and drive. Part three of this series is going to be on the catch and the recovery. If you want to see all three videos, you can go to barbershrug.com. Click on episodes at the top of the page, click on technique quad, and then all the videos for both the jerks, squats, deadlifts, cleans, snatches, and everything else that we have is in the library on the site. We'll see you with part three. And we're back. All right. So She's taking um, over her mic. That's right. Yes. Uh, I have taken over. <laughs> I didn't fall asleep. <laughs> Run by Diane Fu.
Um, so we were simply talking, like, I get the question all the time, hey, you know, you know, where, where's Foo Barbell going next year? You know, what are you going to do? Like, w- what's in store? And that's a legitimate question. And my answer is like, I have really no idea. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, my, my, I'm always like, I don't know. Free like, spirit. I, 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 I like it. It's I more like of a, a, a Taoist view. Like, it'll, the path will unfold before me. Yeah, and that's yeah. basically. You could try to plan it, but it's not going to work river, out the way yes. you plan anyway. The river yes. flows on its own, doesn't it? You, you guys yeah. can be my, my consultants. I'll start calling. Mike, I'm like, hey, Mike, what do you think of this? Um, <laughs> it is grunt. Uh, sounds good. <laughs> uh. Good job. Keep going. Yeah. But, you know, the, the honest answer is I don't know. But what I add on to that is, like, I really hope that Foo Barbell continues to bring interesting experiences in my direction because that's really what I chase is I chase the experience. I chase the education. Yeah. I chase the conversations. Like, I want to continue furthering the conversation of weightlifting on a much, you know, greater, larger scale. So That's you know, the future. That is That is the future. And so, for example, um, my seminaring uh, got me the opportunity. I got to go to Latin America this uh, last uh, just couple months ago in April. And I hung out there for two weeks and I did, you know, one seminar in a seminar in Argentina. Then I went over to Brazil and then I went over to Colombia. And, you know, that that is just amazing. the country is amazing and it's beautiful and the people are warm. Like it was just fantastic and so in each of these boxes like you know I I walk in and a the members are super stoked to have you the community is very welcoming and then B in each of these locations they already have you know these weightlifting coaches kind of installed teaching teaching class and so I'm the first one to be like okay I want to take class from each of these I like I want to see how they teach I want to see what they're doing etc etc and not only are these coaches these are like highly decorated athletes in uh, Argentina I met this um, uh, woman named Nora Coppell she is a three-time Olympian representing Argentina she uh, her Amazing. very first Olympics was in 2000 when women could actually compete in the Olympics on that level of international platform so she was in 2000 2004 2008 I met her I met her coach we trained together we chatted we talked about shop you know I asked them about their system her history like it was it, you know, it was just this amazing and they were as excited to have me as I was like completely excited to be in front of them and talk to them. It's like always this like reverse like fanning thing going on when I meet these people. Amazing like, educational experience that is. You I know can't exactly. Pay for that anywhere. You you cannot. And so it was it was just so great to be around her and to be around her coach and talk and you know hang out with their community. And then when I went to you know Brazil, same thing. Um, you know or Ecuador, excuse me, not Brazil. I want to go to Brazil. We're going to Brazil. We're going yeah. to Brazil. We are going to Brazil. So. Twenty sixteen. Maybe sooner. Yeah, Ecuador was my next country. And so I I get there and same thing. They have a weightlifting coach that's already there that teaches like, you know, five days a week. And here I'm walking in. I'm like, I want to take that class. I want to be around. You know, I want to I want to be here. And so I get in and this coach, Professor Carell, he ends up being um, the national or not. Yeah, the national team coach over at their Olympic training center inside Ecuador. Mm. And so I meet him. We start talking and chopping it up. And he invites me to come down to the training center and train with their junior level girls, which, you know, they're all amazing young women. Like I walk in and there is literally a room of like. 30 girls from like the youngest being age eight all mm-hmm. the way to like 19 18 wow. 19 and so i'm training with them and it's just a, this amazing again it's this amazing experience right and the girls are super excited for me to be there i'm like this tatted up asian american like western thing rock star coming in <laughs> and, and they don't really know what to make of me and i'm just like lifting with them and we're having a good time and it's, that was super fun. And then I head over to Colombia, Beijing, and Beijing is beautiful, guys. Yeah, I mean, if you guys have never been out there, shout out to my Beijing friends. What up, Beijing? <laughs> what up, uh, bitches? <laughs> <laughs> the city is like gorgeous. It's like eternal spring out there, and everything's lush and green. And Sounds terrible. Like, yeah. I know. Damn. Never want to visit. Like, like you go there. And- you, we'll stop there on, like on our way to Brazil. It's hard. It's hard to leave. If like, we have time. Really <laughs> hard to leave. Um, so I make it out there and it's, it's the same thing. You know, their weightlifting coach, Juan, um, happens to be an actual, you know, he's a a professional weightlifter that lifts for Columbia and he's on the national team. And, uh, you know, we got to hang out. We had a good training session together and, you know, there was like, he doesn't really speak much English. I don't speak much Spanish. So we had to have a translator, but the conversation was just very genuine. You share the language of the barbell. You share the language (laughs) of the barbell. 
And uh, it's really cool because, you know, out there, these guys are literally, like, paid to weightlift. Like, they're government-sponsored, government-supported employees. Yeah. So they Which go. Helps. It helps. <laughs> and so literally, like, how, you know, we would all come into our boxes at, you know, whatever time to meet with our athletes or start our day, they would kind of get up in the morning and go down, and that's that's their job. That's what they do, and they can't be late and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's really interesting to learn about how things are done outside of our own country. I'd say this is the most amazing development I've ever seen in my lifting career is to see weightlifting, I guess even powerlifting stuff, but especially weightlifting, see opportunities opening up for people to mix and share ideas and yes. for like individuals like you, like, you know, before 2006, seven, I don't know when I, Mike, when do you think this current renaissance actually kicked off where guys like Kendrick, folks like Diane could actually be prize for their weightlifting knowledge on a wide scale I, you know, it's I not mean, been very long people started getting some no you know notif- noticed probably then but like it's been like three years Dude, unless- i feel like i feel like it's been like three years it's like really taken off like it's- because there was always a few weightlifting coaches that kind of dominated on the internet right. and now there's just like everybody and now we have the situation and, and where weightlifting international is too the knowledge is prized the experiences the opportunities to mix the match and to to get education from these coaches, this is a phenomenal opportunity. If you want to learn it, now is the time yes. to sort of jump on board and get engaged. Well, here's what's really interesting and why I, you know, I feel like it's 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 such a special time for the strength and condition community or weightlifting community, however you guys want to look at it, is that now that we do have all these other voices and some very dominant voices coming in from other countries sharing their information, very eager and happy and open to share their information, no one can now say there's there's this one best way to do something. Right. Nobody can say that. Right. And that's why we don't really hear that. I don't think as much anymore where it's like, hey, there's this only one way and what you do is bad and blah, 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 because there's so many ways to be able to look at movement. There's so many ways to be able to move a barbell. And some of it might depend on body type. Some of it might not. Some might depend on how strong, not strong, you know, whatever you are. But there are very there are a lot of different ways to make this movement occur. Yeah, the different the difference is like you have coaches like 30 years ago. So you have some coaches that are I mean, and. I don't want to. Maybe some people might get mad at me now, but go for I, it. I don't go care. For it. Go for it. Name uh, names. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, there's a lot of older coaches that like, and it's not their fault. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, they were isolated. Right. When a when an athlete walked in the gym, it was like what that coach said, and the coach said this is the best system, and the athletes go, "Yes, sir," and they do it, and it works. Right. And it works for everybody there because it's the only thing that's happening. Right. And and that's a good thing when you don't have access to information. But what's happened now is People can see what's happening over here, over there. People the, are sharing ideas. No more iron curtains where the Soviets have these secrets you don't know about. <clears throat> you know, just yeah. I mean, it was happening, you know, inside the United States. What was happening in Florida isn't being shared with what's happening maybe out in California. Right. And there's two totally different styles, or North Carolina, or whatever, whatever state you want to choose. And there's like, you know, these coaches that dominate that region, and they have very different philosophies than than right. even in other parts of the United States. But now. You know, an athlete has the freedom to just click a button and go, well, that's not what my coach said. Right. Or this is different. Right. And so the coaches that aren't very open-minded anymore may become less uh, relevant, right. I guess you could say. It's a very well, kind way of putting it. Yeah. Here, here's, here's my, because, you know, I, I am always the type of person where I'm like, hey, let's, let's try to see, like, all sides of the coin, right? And so my, my thinking with a lot of the coaches, maybe from, you know, an older generation or older school that, you know, have this one way or have this one philosophy is I've got to believe they continue to hold on to that because, you know, it worked for them in the past. Mm-hmm. And if something works for you for, like, 10, 20, 30, 40 years – there's really no reason to have to change the way you think if it's if it's working yeah. for you. Well, when, t- mm-hmm. when people athletes come to me and go, yeah. "Oh, should I change programs?" and I go, "Oh, are you reaching your goals with what you're doing now?" and they go, "Yes." I go, "Well, don't change anything." I mean, I agree with that, but right. there's also also open. You know, I, think, I think part of the people, benefit of having things. multiple perspectives is that it might have worked for you, but you're you. You're you're one body type. You're you're one set of experiences. If you're training a variety of people with different body types, different backgrounds, yes. different levels of strength, different whatever, then having multiple perspectives makes you a better coach because you're not getting just one type right. of person. You're getting a variety. What's been very useful about, you know, seeing all these different, having all these different conversations, you know, and obviously recently I've been having, for those of you guys that follow me on social media, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've been having more conversations with the Chinese coach, uh, his name, Coach Wu. He's the Singaporean national team coach. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, I've been having more conversations 
conversations, he's been very graciously spending time with me literally on a weekly basis um, over Skype, talking to me about Chinese weightlifting philosophy, how he coaches. He's been coaching me a little bit because I've been trying to kind of, you know, anytime I come across a new philosophy, a new style of movement, you know, I make it a point instead of just understanding it conceptually, I try to internalize it physically. So I will go through whatever span of time it takes for me to adapt to that style of movement and be able to then, you know, experience it for myself because I feel like that's more interesting and to me that is more valuable which in turn is going to be more valuable for my audience you're like a weightlifting right? technique connoisseur i am i am <laughs> yeah. a purveyor of all styles well, she's learning know. the right way right. this is how you become an awesome coach is you're you open know. and you absorb everything you can yeah and here's the deal is like so far my experience has been with you know practicing all these different ways to move it's like it, it, in, immediately it's awkward immediately your numbers oh, yeah. go down immediately like everything is just like you know feels like it's falling apart but then as you start to adapt to the movement as to, as, as soon as your body starts to develop that motor control what i find is my numbers start coming back to around the same area as what i had before so kind of all roads kind of lead to the same destiny you know what i mean i think a lot of athletes get caught up in that that you uh maybe make a suggestion for a technique change right and they don't feel an immediate PR coming on. Yeah. And they they, they yeah. want to ditch the technique. I'm like, well, you might want to, let's commit two or three weeks to this technique to see if it benefits you over time. You have to learn how to do it, for one. Um, and then maybe you need to build up a little strength in slightly different positions. Right, right. And so, you know, a lot of people want to like, you know, they want that immediate result from a technique change. Right. So it, and, and sometimes it happens if it's something that is similar enough to the way they move and you can simply feel like, yeah. hey, do this, and they do it, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm the best coach ever. Um, but, you know, other times it does definitely take some time and positional strength and awareness, et cetera. Well, it sucks when people only think of progress in terms of what they can do now. Uh, when you make a change, you experiment, which is a great thing to do to get outside your comfort zone. Numbers go down. you got to keep in mind, of what do I stand to benefit? Like, what are the benefits that could come to me, you know, three months, a year down the line? That is doing something different, understanding and internalize that there's not one way of doing things, that right. there's not one sort of magical program, that one thing that's going to work for you. If your numbers go down now, be patient. It could be the best thing you ever did with your lifting career. Right. Well, here's here's the other thing that I believe is like, you know, I, I make the statement out there and hopefully I'm not like bursting anyone's bubble, but I'm like. Burst it. Oh, God, Burst you know, it hard. None of us are going to the Olympics, right? <gasps> We're going, sorry, we're going I'm sorry. Going to no, but we are. We're going in 2016, so that's not true. We might <laughs> we're be going all, to we're talking about this. all going to the Olympics. <laughs> to watch. Um, <laughs> to, to watch, yeah. <laughs> well, so, I'll be drinking a beer while other people are competing. Yeah. <laughs> to drink sugar cane cocktails. Maybe we can sneak backstage. Like, you know, all of us are maybe a little too late to the party to be able to make it onto that national platform, unless you are a special person, right? And we've seen, obviously, special <laughs> people inside our own community that is now representing us on an international stage, and that's really damn cool. But for the rest of us, it's about, you know, it's about the experience. And, you know, if you're, if you just want to chase performance, great. Pick a style, you know, nail that style down, get strong around that style, build your body, build the mechanics and just have at it and see how far you can go. You know, but for the rest of us, you know, the experience might be like, hey, you know, let's see how many ways I can, you know, make this barbell gymnastics work for me. Right. How many ways can I do this? And what's been really cool for me as a coach is that having learned and had all these conversations and trying to really internalize all these different styles of movements, athletes that come in from out of town, from different regions of the world, different regions of our own country, I can watch how they move and do a little intake with them and be like, hey, what coach do you work with? You know, what, you know, how did you learn? And yeah. just kind of watch them move, find out who they've worked with. And immediately I know what style of movement they can do. And I can coach to that mm. if it's appropriate and that if that's what they want. Or sometimes they're like, no, just like pretend I'm a piece of clay and remold me. And so then I could teach them something that I may personally feel is better for their body type. It may or may not be. You know, obviously, it's always a big experiment. But it's that's been the value is I've taken athletes that come in and I've been like, well, this is how um, this is how I learned. This is how, you know you know, whoever I've worked with, number of people, you know, want me to change. And I'm like, no, you know, actually the way you're moving works, ends up working really well. Let's go ahead and teach you how to utilize how you're naturally moving to your advantage. Yeah. And I've recently done that with a couple um, games athletes uh, where, you know, they were then now able to take it out onto the field and basically sl snatch like a lifetime PR in the hang. And then that's been really cool to oh, observe, wow. just validating like what they're doing isn't necessarily incorrect. 
right, isn't incorrect, that we can actually make that line of movement a little just bit stronger. Tighten it up a little tighten bit. Tighten it up to their advantage. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I need you to coach me today. Let's do it. Mike yeah, needs some tightening up. I have, I have <laughs> snatched. Well, I, I'm in the perfect situation because I've snatched twice this year. Right. <laughs> Yes, like, and, so, and when you said 115, I hope I didn't offend you when I asked pounds or kilos. Well, I mean, I'd been injured, so I, you didn't offend me. I was like, kilos? I'm like, and this is your second time snatching? You have been muscle snatching. Yes. I, well, really I, heavy. i had been muscle snatching. You're not just sitting on your ass. No, no, I was training hard. I just yeah. hadn't snatched in a while, like real snatch. That's amazing. That's, so, that's, that's impressive. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, but I'm in the perfect spot because I think my technique is probably just all over the place right now. Uh, it, d- it didn't feel tight the other day when I uh, did it, so maybe we can. Uh, let's, maybe let's I'll just let, I'll just later. Let you d- can can I watch you mold Mike and then just have some popcorn just watch you mold him and, and laugh? <laughs> <laughs> I might actually then be in turn watching you. <laughs> Don't mold me! In, oh God, <laughs> you got a lot of molding to do. Uh, we so have to get do, a machine out for Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, do you and Kendrick uh, share a lot of very similar philosophies, and that's why you guys decided to partner together for this uh, seminar coming up? Um, Kendrick and I share a lot of very similar philosophy because obviously we can't. We, you know, he came up in the American system. I came into the American system, and so you know, a lot of the thinking, a lot of the philosophies are the same. And you know, Kendrick is. You know, he's like, he, he keeps things, his coaching style is very effective, very simple in the sense like, he's like, hey, do work. He's like, the snatch is a snatch. And the way he coaches is, it's very simple, but it's very powerful. And we decided to come together because, you know, we've been following each other on social media for quite some time now. We, you know, had opportunities to hang out at nationals last year. Mm. So we've had many conversations and we like how the other person, you know, uh, represents themselves. And we have a lot of respect for one another Mm -hmm. and so we decided to like hey what would happen if we decided to come together and do a training workshop you know for our respective audiences and we're like let's just make this a one-time deal let's make it special let's make it fun let's do it at you know uh like norcal jason kalipa's gym right can we go? <laughs> you guys should be, absolutely. This sounds like a situation where the, the parts equal something far greater than the whole. What, combine the these strategies. And, yeah, what, what's I mean, the date on this? Uh, June 8th, 9th, and 10th. So next. It's oh. like next week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, next, it's next week. You guys want to fly back next Damn week? Damn it, June. Uh, uh, we just flew to like six cities in a row. We fly yeah. home and then fly right back. And then, then I got to go to three cities in a row right after that. Yeah, that's I'm going to stay home on this yeah, one. Let's just, yeah, I'm not doing that. Sorry. I would love to go. Yeah, trust me. I would love to be there. It's going to be, we wanted to create a fun experience. We want to create a unique experience for people. And so we're, we're test driving this out and you know, if you are within driving distance, get your ass to NorCal. Yeah. Come on out. Come hang out. I mean, just fly. But oh yeah, okay. It'll be like a couple of days out by when this pops. When this uh, podcast People posts, like, you'll have like two days right, notification. Two days, Get in the van is it and drive. Um, it is. We still have a few slots left. A few slots left. Yeah. Okay, so maybe on Wednesday when this posts, there, there'll be uh, <laughs> a couple more for you guys. A to sign spot up. open yes. for you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your Kickstarter. So let's do it. You talked about the the last time I was here. Um, you talked a little bit about a potential book that might be coming out. Right. And then uh, you pulled the trigger and put it on Kickstarter. And uh, actually, I'll let you talk about it. But, uh, you know, the Kickstarter may not have gone. It doesn't look like it went <laughs> like you wanted it to go. So I want to talk about two things. First, the book, because I think the book idea is brilliant. And then, uh, secondly, what we might have learned from Kickstarter campaigns. Well, <laughs> this is where now the audience is going to get to learn um, from <laughs> other people's failure. Um, so there you go. There you go. Uh, it's a good learning experience. So last last time we got together, you know, we I had this idea for a book. Uh, came across this guy Eric. Um, he's down at CrossFit Hollywood in LA, and uh, you know he's in the animation world. So he works a lot with kind of animators in both cartoons, animators and comics. And so he's been doing that side for I mean I think over thirty years. He said. Wow. And so we decided to come together because I, you know, have appreciation for art. I'm into animation, um, you know, a little bit geeked out, not super geeked out, but a little bit geeked out yeah, on that side. Yeah, tons of cool tattoos. Yeah, I got, you know, obviously I got tattoos. So I like art. And so, you know, when we kind of got together and started talking, we're like, hey, let's, let's put this project together where we can write a book that is part philosophical, about my experiences, about the way I think about weightlifting, but let's also combine the art side of it. And and so instead of like photos of people where, you know, you you would open a a traditional weightlifting reference or technique, technique book and it'd be done a thousand times. Yeah. You know, there's like photos of people on the block and the hang and the whatever we wanted to make it all illustrated. 
And so the idea was to be able to procure like eight to 10 artists and have every single one of them have a different style of art mm -hmm. and have them take up different pieces of this book. And we didn't want to get too too geeked out where this became like a reference book we wanted it to be beautiful enough so that people can prop it up on their coffee table and be able to flip through it learn something from it but then also be able to appreciate beautiful art at the same time it'll be on my coffee table yes even if i'm living in a trailer yep. and i'm trying to minimize my life <laughs> thank you <laughs> it deepens the connection with the sport i'd say and yeah. so um we put together this project uh we had this great idea we created a video for it and we decided to launch it on kickstarter and uh it came out the very first day it generated you know um a decent response i you know but for what we needed in terms of volume of people it was a little underwhelming and it's been continuously to be underwhelming <laughs> a, lot and, a lot of people so, might not know what kickstarter even is like how does that work briefly well you know so kickstarter if you a first of all if you don't have kickstarter you, to even buy the book there's a couple loopholes you have to jump through right so you have to go on to kickstarter you have to have the person create an account on kickstarter mm -hmm. sign into kickstarter and mm -hmm. then find your project and then you know support right. them too yeah. so but they're, they're going to crowdfund of, the book they're going to yes. give you money so you can make this thing they can they'll give you the well they're pledging the money so the okay. idea is like with yeah. the kickstarter they pledge i pledge at these different tiers and mm -hmm. at different tiers you get certain uh I don't want to use the word rewards, but you, you basically get certain, um, you either buy the book or you get books plus rap, t-shirt, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So there's different tiers you can pledge into. Just yeah. so you know, I went you for the, like I went for the highest, highest tier. That's why we love you. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's the Brown man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think a lot of people see that and they go, oh, wow, I can just have an idea and people will just give me money for no reason. That's yeah. fantastic. And it's probably not that, it's not, not that easy. Not quite that easy. It's yeah. technically true. But <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, we kind of went into this thing thinking like, oh, yeah, you and I think it's such a great idea. Let's try to sell this idea. And so as we kind of got into it, what we found is that we were when we started the Kickstarter, we were already behind and we didn't even realize we were behind. Yeah. And we had 30 days to get fifty thousand dollars funded. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, based off just my audience alone, my supporters, we got, you know, what I would consider a normal response from my audience when I put out a particular product. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's just not quite enough to fund that level of volume. And so, you know, we were trying to learn as you go. And with something that's a little time sensitive, you cannot learn as you go. You have to be ready. Mm -hmm. And what we learned from this last month is like, you know, if you're going to start a campaign where, campaign where you're going to fundraise, you need to have all your ducks already lined up mm -hmm. and you need to come into this thing with momentum so that, you know, at some point in the middle, you hit critical mass, that typical yeah. point happens and it just goes viral. Mm -hmm. right? The thing becomes real. That yeah. It becomes real. And so the campaigns that we then started looking into when we started reaching out a little bit further and trying to find information from, you know, other people like, hey, you know, how do you make this thing work? How do you make this thing bigger? Uh, you know, we realized like, oh, you, you know, whereas we were like the, the shotgun where we're like, bang, bang. You needed to be like the rapid assault like <laughs> weapon where you're like, mm. like literally <laughs> on a daily basis yeah. firing information off to your supporters, being yeah. in front of people's be faces, yeah. like, just like be the assault weapon. And, you know, I am usually very sensitive about people's time, like maybe a little overly sensitive. I don't want to, you know, overwhelm people with posts. I don't want to yeah. fatigue their interests. And so I'm always very sensitive about how I ask for people's time when I post. And so we posted maybe once or twice a week about the campaign. Yeah. And when we looked at other campaigns that were successful that would raise, you know, over half a million. There's campaigns that have been on Kickstarter that raise like serious cash. Serious like cash. Like over a million, I think. Yeah. yeah. Serious yeah. cash. Like, you know, close to like the one I was following really closely, like they raised, you know, in about a twelve week span, like uh three quarter million. Yeah. Like something crazy like yeah. that. Wow. wow. And yeah. literally they before the Kickstarter even started, they had momentum. They had a, you know, they had pages set up. There was media already around it. They had a product already created, and so yep. what they were asking for is for money to be able to create more of this product. Right. Mm. Yeah. And then all the way until the very kind of final hours, like the very final hours that they were shutting down the campaign, they would literally post on the hour, like, "Hey, yeah. we have five hours left. Hey, we have four hours left. Hey, we have three hours. Hey, last hour." 
Yeah. yeah. Like it was just, wow. you know, it was the whole political campaign. It is a everything whole, has to be and I was like, like, marketing. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, this is cool. This is how it should be done. So that was yeah. the great kind of learning curve yeah. of this whole experience. Well, what I like about Kickstarter is is you can sell your idea right. without having to put that initial investment in. I mean, some people do. You were talking about they already had a product developed. Right. And now they just gotta be able to make a thousand of them. Right. Or something like that. Uh, I, I think so we bought into something recently called Coin right. where they did that and uh, you know, when they finally make this product in bulk, we'll get it in the mail. Um, but uh, Kickstarter is cool because you can sell it before you get committed financially. Uh, and then the other thing too is like, so what you guys were asking for was fifty thousand dollars. How how much time did you give yourself? Thirty days. Thirty. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, know, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. So fifty thousand dollars in thirty days, which is pretty aggressive. Right. And then, uh, so what happens is if you if you people don't reach if you don't reach your goal fifty thousand dollars. Uh, then the money goes, you know, it's an escrow. It goes back to those people. Right, nothing gets charged. Right, if you don't reach your goal, it goes back to the everyone's account, so it doesn't happen. Uh, now, if you hit your goal, you can raise money beyond that. Right. And so, like, there's always that, we did a Kickstarter once, and I, I can talk about that maybe another time. <laughs> we did way worse than you, if you <laughs> <laughs> to make you feel better. Don't feel so bad. And it, we were we gonna, raised hundreds of dollars. Uh, we yeah. wanted to do a weightlifting documentary, and we even had people like- You know what? I actually remember that. Yeah. Oh, really? I remember your guys' Kickstarter video. It was terrible, was like, wasn't that was like it? like two or three years ago. <laughs> like, I, wow. It sucked. I, re- I actually- no, Yeah, that was about three or four, that was maybe four years three ago. Three-ish? Yeah, three yeah, years yeah. ago. It was you before the show. You guys wanted to travel the country, right? No, we were wanting to follow- uh, what was it? It was Zach. We want to follow Zach Chris uh, the Olympics, potentially. We want to follow Zach to Pan Ams and then kind of just watch the the team as they prepared for the Olympics. Got it. But we were going to follow Zach, specific, Zach Critch specifically and just kind of see how it all went down, like what that process might look like. Right. And a lot of people were excited about it, but not enough people were excited about it. I think we needed around... I think we were asking for thirty thousand, maybe fifty thousand. I forget mm. what it was, but yeah, I mean it's it's a lot harder than you think it's going to be because you know, there you're like, oh yeah, of course we only need like fifty bucks from you know a hundred people or yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. You, you or, have or to a thousand really people. Be, oh, we'll do it. There has to be a whole campaign behind selling your idea. It can't just be like I have this great idea and then you know. Well, that's the whole point. Where people go, well, that is a great idea, but that, having that idea translate to me giving you money is just a whole other yes. step, right? And, and it's and hard because you got you knew that you needed fifty thousand right. dollars, but maybe you could ask for thirty thousand dollars and right. then kept campaigning after you hit your mark, right? Because that's like a whole See, nother, that's, that's something we didn't even think about. That's a whole other right. because There's now a strategy behind it. Yeah, there, yeah, that's a whole other because once you hit the mark, now you got to change your marketing right. again. Right. So it's. But that's the thing is like all the companies we then started investigating when we were like in the middle of this project were, it was like, I was looking at this and I'm like, oh my God, I would probably need to literally cut my actual work day in half so I could spend half of my day Mm -hmm. trying to fund for this project. Like it is its own kind of part slash full-time job. Full-time marketing job. Full-time. Back to earning money. This is stupid. <laughs> yeah. No, you signed up for I it for all. I thought it was going to be, I, I don't think you thought it was going to be easy, but yeah. No. It's, I, it's you always, just, it's you just don't know until you get in it. You, you just, don't know. Yeah. And we just yeah. kind of just pulled the trigger. We're like, hey, let's do this. You think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. And I think the other pro- problem is like, if it was just a book on, you know, my experience, my philosophy, A, we wouldn't have had to fund as much. And B, right. it's a little more concrete in people's hand. Yeah. When you start talking about, hey, you're going to buy a book that's, you know, part technique, part weightlifting philosophy, part, you know, you know, your experience as a coach, comma, all these artists, and you don't really have the art to line up to show people, you yeah. know, then they're just buying into something that they can't, that's not as tangible. Yeah. I think that another, that was the other piece we learned that was difficult. So people felt, like things that are tangible. I felt real strongly about it for, right. for probably a couple of reasons. One, I got to talk to you one-on-one about it. Hey. And I got fired <laughs> up about it. Number two is like, I get excited about new things. Which Especially is not, pretty colors. Not everybody. <laughs> not everybody like gets colors. excited about like new things. Right. And so those two things attracted me to it. And so I was like, oh, I want this to happen. What is your plan now? Like now, what, how many days are left? Where? What? How much money? I, want, I mean, I, I, it's good for people to like see failure. In I want to see. I want to say that we have. What? What? What's the date, guys? Is it the twenty ninth? Twenty ninth, and mm-hmm. there's thirty one days in this month. Thirty days. Yes, thirty one. Thirty one. So we've got two days left. 
Uh, <laughs> it'll be over on 45 Wednesday. 45 k. 45. Yes, we are at 49. No, we are at probably 20 percent of our funding goal. Uh-huh. Right. So it's around you 10 k. 10 k probably pretty low. And uh, you know, obviously, it's it's it won't fund. And we're going to let it kind of just quiet down, cool down. We'll probably email out to all our supporters that, you know, did help with this project and thank them for their support. And what we're looking at doing now is basically we're still going to create a book. We're probably going to have to downsize the number of pages. We'll probably downsize the number of artists that we're going to use. And we're going to create a very mini version of this book that, you know, of this like kind of greater scale. And we're going to fund it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're going to still kind of go into this thing. And what this we're going to use as this kind of... um, let's say half book or mini book that we're going to create. We're going to then create a campaign around that to show the there audience. And then we're going to start back, again, right? basically start again. And this time we'll have the product. We'll be able to show people. People will be able to get sample of the written work. People will be able to see samples of the artwork. They're going to be able to actually have something tangible in their eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. And be like, Hey, this is essentially what you are buying into, but take this and magnify it and so make it bigger. You keep saying we. You mean you and the artists, or who, uh, who's me we? Me and Eric. Eric, my partner that I'm doing this. He's in mm. charge of the animation side, so he would be the one procuring the artists, um, basically kind of producing or project managing that end of it. And I'm going to call Eric it. out. Eric, Eric, hey. I call, No, I called him last week. Oh, he, did you? He didn't call me back. Oh, he didn't? Bad Eric. Rascal. Oh, Bad no. Eric. He's, Bad Eric. he's busy drawing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's working on the book. Yeah, look at, this whole project is interesting because it's, it's an example of it was not failure is like a bad word to use. Right. Like you, you, you had a great idea. It is a great idea. You jumped in. You learned a lot. And because you learned a lot, you'll ha- you'll come up with something that's better. If it worked out yes. this first time, it wouldn't have been as good as it will be once you go through the process a few times and refine yes. it and tighten it up and amplify it. Yes. So wise. Absolutely. It is Agreed. true. Wise words. If it has worked, it'd be fucking not fun at all. Right. If it just, oh, we had a different book. It landed great. We did it. Uh, okay, now we're bored with it. Fuck. What <laughs> well, what it allows, I think what it really allowed us to do is it allowed us to be able to reflect on the experience. And like I said, like Foo Barbell, like I really hope it brings like interesting experiences. I hope I continue to learn. And this is just another learning process. You know, and what we like about it is like it kind of kind of forced us to kind of make some decisions at the end of like, okay, hey, this isn't going to fund. Now what are we going to do? Yeah. Right? What's the next step? And if you continue to ask yourself those kind of questions, that's when you start to grow. Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. I so what, are, what other projects you got on the horizon? Anything else you want to talk about right now? You know, um, in terms of actual project projects, not really. Uh, I guess, you know, I created some programs out there for my more kind of beginning audience, uh, beginning kind of weightlifting fans. Mm-hmm. Cody app, right? The Cody app. It's fantastic. And so Cody app is this company that, you know, uh, we are working with where they essentially are a, uh, a training program platform. I think they started out where they are similar to Instagram where you can track your workouts mm-hmm. on a daily basis, you know, provide a photo uh, kind of document of what you did for the day. And, you know, from there you can kind of share with the community, hold each other accountable, see what other people are doing. So that was a really neat concept. And now they're kind of pivoting a little bit and they're, instead of doing just a kind of a fitness, an online fitness journaling, mm-hmm. they're now starting to pivot more into kind of training programs where they want to start providing training programs for the population like say hey I want to learn you know more about yoga I want to learn more about Olympic weightlifting I want to learn more about powerlifting etc etc or gymnastics or what have you you know you'll be able to sign on to their uh, platform and be able to purchase and follow all these different um, you know experts in their respective yeah. fields and purchase programs. So we created a kind of a beginner product out there where mm-hmm. it was a 12 week builder program. And the idea or the goal behind the program was to essentially give people a working snatch clean and jerk by the time where they were done. Yeah. And it, you know, had good popularity, uh, very good feedback. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to start creating more programs along that to be able to service that audience in the form of, you know, correction. So now that you've come out of the 12 weeks, these are probably some, you know, kind of general habits you formed. Yeah. And if you want to break these habits, these are the exercises. This is how you do them. You know, these are things you want to look for. And so it's really providing people a resource for a coach if they don't have already access to it. Yeah. There's a lot of people training in garages or yeah. or in uh, gyms where there's just not a, like a weightlifting they just expert. Don't have it. Yeah. And the feedback that we've been getting, you know, with this application is they're like, oh my god, we've been following your program. It's helped me so much. Um, you know, uh, I, I train out of my gym or I train out of my own garage and my platform in such and such a place and there's yeah. no access to any weightlifting coach anywhere in my area. So mm-hmm. this has helped me tremendously. So, you know, we're really, you know, 
we're really happy that, you know, we can help these people out when they can't go seek out help elsewhere. You're you know, doing the good, Diane. Yeah. You're doing good for the yeah. world and <laughs> yes. the community. I'm trying. <laughs> trying my best. So how, how does someone get a hold of the, the Cody app? They just literally download the Cody app can, on their phone? Yeah, CodyApp.com or you or CodyApp.com website. So it's mm. web-based as well. Or C-O-D-Y. You can just, yeah, C-O-D-Y, A-P-P. Um, or you can go ahead and download it on your iPhone. Yeah. Then, is that like a monthly subscription thing or a one-time fee no. for a 12-week course or is it free? Or? Okay, so the, the course program is uh, it's $99, I believe, if I mistake, I'm sorry. It's somewhere around that price point where you can get a 12-week program. Um, everything is video based. So what's unique about this product with, uh, with Cody is that instead of just giving you a program, which anybody can pull a program anywhere these days, right? Mm-hmm. Here's my program. There's no shortage of programs. There's no shortage of programming. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not saying this program is any more special, but we've laid it out or I've laid it out in a way where, you know, it's really meant to be a foundation underneath a lot of other programs that are currently uh, considered beginner programs out there. Because when coaches take a look at beginner programs, they're like, okay, well, a beginner program means that you are going to um, snatch power snatch from the hang for you know, five sets of five, Mm -hmm. right? You're going to do that for, you know, a period of time. And then you're going to hang, you know, hang power clean. And then, you know, maybe do a push press and you're you're going to slowly build up through movement. Yeah. And this program does that, but it also contains a lot of under layers of positional work. So meaning I will literally program in there footwork drills. So I tell you to do your footwork yeah. drills. And then I will program in there to do, you know, positional drills with just a PVC pipe. So it's it's really basic and it really looks to take somebody that's brand new and kind of mold them from the bottom up. And then what we do on top of that is we provide literally video instruction, right? So you'll see video instruction of myself of, or movement instruction for myself, uh, any one of my other athletes performing every single movement that's mm-hmm. within that day's program. And you'll see like laser beams pop out from every single angle saying, Lasers. This is, yeah, laser like, beams. Now I'm sold. Right? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all right every there. You touch corner. it. It's, all, it, it, it's laid out very simply. It very makes sense. Very simple. We know we give you like cues, like you know this is this is what you look for with the feet, knees, everything. So it's 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 very very comprehensive, and we really really want to try and make it as simple as possible for people to follow. You're not just telling people what to do. It's like it's sort of like a, it walks you through and sort of walks gives you, you through. gets you comfortable. Yeah, and you can literally pull it up and do it, and you know have your phone with you inside your gym or inside your garage or wherever, and be like, okay, listen to like just two three minute video, watch the program. You can replay it over and over and over again. God, we're all so fucking spoiled. Yeah. Imagine having that when you're in high school, Mike. Like this a magical device in your pocket that could pull all this coaching information down from the cloud somewhere. I wish I could have just gotten a decent book in high school. <laughs> like on training. I, I wish mean, I could read in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of the downfalls of being homeschooled is uh, not being able to read. <laughs> but now we're all like, saying, oh, you kids nowadays with your iPhones and your coaching. Back in my day, we had to download Rogue magazines or not download, just just find it on Dude, the. I, had a, I went to Kroger, you know, grocery store and picked up muscle and fitness. And yeah. that was like. That was training advice. That was it. That's yeah. all, that's. I think that's how everyone learned that. That was. That was very, very those common. Are, those are the dark ages, wasn't those it, Those are the dark ages. <laughs> where information sure. was extremely limited. Yeah, yeah, just break yourself and figure it out. Then Maybe hopefully you sometimes teach even to your imagination. Like, yeah. hey, what can you think of to do with yeah. this dumbbell? Yeah, I definitely did some really dumb things. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with yeah. that. That's how you know how, not to how do did it I, now. How did I not get hurt? Yes. Uh, amazing. Uh, any other projects we're leaving out here? <sighs> So I think we're going to wrap Man. it up soon. You got to spread yourself more thin. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, uh, what do you do all day anyway? <laughs> I try to do it all. Um, you know, Can we work think, together on a, on a special gelato flavor for our cheat meals? We yes. talked a little bit of cheat meals, and you weren't divulging much about your cho- – yes. you said people would maybe be – they wouldn't get your cheat meals. They would be – what is your favorite, your favorite cheat? When, when, favorite when Diane is, is worn out from a long day of food barbelling it up and dominating the world <laughs> – you go home to your nice San Francisco flat or wherever you are. You open the refrigerator. What are you reaching for? Oh, man. Um, my favorite cheat meal would have got to be bacon maple donuts. We have, Whoa. We have donuts. Do we, we get, have a bacon, maple, maple bacon? Do we have bacon maple? Let's do by, some by training. The way, by the way, thank you to you for bringing us lunch and donuts. John, John Shout Russian. Shout out on the show. John Russian thank showed you, John. up. 
Shout out to uh, San Francisco. Drove down with a box of Voodoo Donuts, and one of them is a bacon maple donut. A bacon it, maple donut. He drove 14 we can some hours and to bring that. us donuts. Well, can you imagine <laughs> any combination more perfect than bacon maple? Because the donut essentially is just a canvas. Is right? there chocolate in there? Uh, I don't know. We can I, maybe add it. I don't know. We can probably add anything. anything we'll smear it on. <laughs> bacon maple donut with some custard. Oh, you just took it to the next level. Yeah. <laughs> I'm custard I mean, you anything. can see I'm thinking and now I'm salivating. Take anything and inject custard into it and I'm joining the party. Yes. <laughs> Bacon maple with custard. Oh, oh my God. Well, next time we're coming with a dozen of those. Uh, uh, I mean, you we're going to get a shot voodoo, of these voodoo, donuts. Voodoo donuts are uh, the best donuts They're like in world the entire famous. world. Yeah. Get a tight shot, CTP. Man. Oh, that, Close up. That's it right there. Oh, they, if you're listening porn. right now, you're like, what are they? Okay. What are they doing? I'm so, I don't, oh, I don't there is bacon on it. There's nothing uh, good were, about them. Around. There's nothing wrong about them. There's they're nothing just, wrong. With they're that. just what they are, and they're glorious. Full strips of bacon on that what donut, that? by the way. Is there custard in that one? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's work out, and then you can have that one. Oh, there's they're, they're stacked that's, in there. There's a box full of donuts. That's a beautiful donuts. thing, and I love the box. Bless your heart, sir. <laughs> that's our post workout meal. I got a well. I got an email. I didn't. I'm like. I was like a week behind on my email, and he he. Uh, and we were gonna meet up today, obviously, and I, that's all I knew. And then I he had sent me an email on Monday. He was like, "Hey, I'm gonna drop by, and you know, do you, would you guys want some voodoo donuts?" And I'm on the plane checking my email. I'm like, "Yes, I'm gonna meet him in a few hours." Shit, man, I hope you got those donuts, man. <laughs> Starry, like, bro. Yes, yes. You made the right decision. I figured I did. This guy's got talent. You're going someplace. <laughs> and you coincidentally had just done a, a seminar up at his his gym in Seattle? Yes. Or the, the gym that you work at? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's a great community. Um, I love Seattle. I'm going back there, I think. Uh, what was the name of that gym again? The Lab. The lab. lab Gym. Shout yeah, out to those guys. Lab. Hey. Um, I'm going to be heading up there in a kind of a, a few months, I think. I, I don't know my interior off the top of my head. But uh, if you guys are ever in Seattle, you need to check out this uh, restaurant called Quinn's. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. Do you know that restaurant? Quinn's? Quinn's. Oh, my God. No. So when I travel around, I allow myself at least the luxury of here's, here's Diane Fu when she travels. Um, I'll hit up a new city. I'll roll in, check in, whatever, get my car, and I'll yelp you know, a nice restaurant kind of in the area. And my favorite thing to do is, uh, you know, show up at this restaurant. I like to sit at the bar. I like to order myself a nice cocktail. And What um, is a cocktail of choice? Um, I usually either like an Old Fashioned or a Manhattan. Ooh, look at you. I, I'm, I'm fancy. Yeah. Fancy. Uh, and Hardcore. So, <laughs> and so I'll have one, not two, because then if I'm two, I'm very slow the next day. Yeah. But I'll have a nice cocktail. And then the, the way I decide which restaurant I'm going to go to is I look up three things and I hope I don't, enrage anyone by saying these three things hmm. uh foie gras is number one yeah. not enraged so far it's fantastic i know i know but what, what was that foie gras Go- goose liver man fatty goose liver it's fantastic yes. foie gras bone marrow oh yeah and uh pork belly yes no. oh yes you know what the best pork belly i've ever tasted in my life where was prepared by this man right here chris uh, moore oh yeah, yeah. i have some uh culinary skill uh, we, <laughs> i'll roast you a nice pork belly diane uh, <laughs> we'll have two Oh. Manhattan's with it because I like being slow the next day. Oh. <laughs> That's the whole point of drinking, right? <laughs> he must be having those Manhattans every night. Oh, you rascal! Look, you're so adorable, uh. man. You're so adorable. I'll let you get away with it. <laughs> but yeah, those are you know my three uh, my three qualifiers for restaurants. So if it has one of those three, and especially if it's got good reviews on Yelp then I am beelining for that restaurant. And uh, Quinn's in Seattle has all three of those. Uh, oh, three, uh, damn. Three no, I want to go to Seattle now. <laughs> Let's go to Seattle. I mean, you pork belly and, and bone marrow. Let's I'm get, on board yes. with the, the first thing you said. I'm yes. still, still a mystery to me. experienced. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. We'll, we'll learn you. Learn me. All right. Uh, where can people find you, Diane? Uh, follow Foo Barbell on Facebook. Diane Foo on Instagram. Diane Foo on Twitter. Um, or you can send me some smoke signals, uh, carrier pigeons. That'd be actually <laughs> as well. Yeah. Uh, Diane has the best Instagram, yes. uh, for weightlifting Mike in the whole wide world. So kind. So, uh, well, I mean, you, you, you must, you like type paragraphs. Yes. You take like a 15 second video and then have like a book written underneath. It's, it's a lot of great free information, skill. man. It is a skill. I had to spend. Her thumbs are amazing. Well, yes. Um, they're very calloused also. Um, but <laughs> I, it literally took 
a very long time to figure out how to create paragraphs, how to maintain oh, yeah. paragraphs. Yeah. Is this not, they don't let you just do that. No, you have, you to, hack you have to hack the system. Yeah. <laughs> I have learned how to it's hack skill. the Instagram platform. Please, Facebook, do not change that. that no. Destroy me. But uh, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Very cool. It's working. All right, guys. After you uh, go follow Diane everywhere, make sure you go to barbellshrug.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Thanks for joining us today. Guys, Enjoy thank you. It. Now we're going to wait. So much fun. Let's do it. Thanks, Diane.